a cup of coffee. Thank you very much for coming at 7.30. That means, you know, we're already ahead of many people who prefer to be a little bit cozy, right? <laughs> and take a, good, uh, take a good sleep. Anyways, we'll try to energize everyone uh, with a very interesting conversation. And I think, you know, when we speak about how the world is changing, impacted by technology, um, you know, and that it's disrupting our lives and we're going to change everything. Look outside of the window because the God is laughing, right? Uh, unfortunately, two of our speakers were not able to make uh, to the panel due to the weather conditions. However, I'm very happy that we are joined by a very remarkable speaker, Trisha, from the uh, Institute of Human Capital. Um, so we have also a bit of inclusiveness and gender balance on the panel as well, <laughs> right? That's another topic which is quite important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the future workforce. Um, the, my name is Tetiana Kretova, and I'm the uh, regional director for Asia Pacific for one of the world's uh, top educational institutions. And uh, having started um, uh, about 50 years ago as uh, the business school uh, by one of the remarkable entrepreneurs in Spain, today we grew to be in the top 10 uh, running together with the Ivory League based out of uh, Madrid. And uh, along with the business school, we have four other schools, and one of them, which I call a highly potential baby, is the School of Human Sciences and Technology. And um, in this school, we're actually uh, delivering career-focused uh, career degrees. And this would be uh, the guys who are doing the big data, the cybersecurity, and all of those, um, you know, and getting like all of those skills which uh, we are requiring today on the market. However, unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of trained professionals. The change is moving really fast, and of course no one will be uh, arguing that it's uh, bringing a particular change towards the uh, social aspects, impacting on the redistribution of uh, wealth and um, access to, uh, access of educa to education on one side becomes easier, on the other one it's bringing quite a big uh, disparity as well. We've been having a conversation with the panelists how we would like to shape uh, the session of today and we all agreed that as any other revolution, and there were three uh, before that, right, the fourth industrial revolution of course is bringing a number of structural changes uh, to industries and it's requiring us uh, to evolve. However, rather than focusing on what's going to be bad about it and who is going to lose and uh, should we do the universal income, we thought why don't we focus on the opportunities and explore together of what are the positive impacts, what are the new evolving business models. We have panelists uh, and I will allow them to introduce themselves because I think they will do it much more better than me. Um, together with the question of how do they see what are the new business models that are evolving today in their industry? How is it impacting their, their industry? And I will leave it there, and probably I will start with you, Trisha, because you're representing... Just um, next to you. Exactly, yeah. because you're representing the... Uh, uh, sorry, you're the director of the Social uh, Capital Institute, and uh, I would love to hear from you. What do you observe is happening at the industry level, and also we had a um, conversation yesterday, if you feel there is a difference, for example, between the <coughs> demands of the unicorns in terms of human capital and, and the big companies. So we'll start with you, and then I guess, you know, uh, we'll just uh, move around, uh, learning specifically what is the impact of the current technological uh, change on and new business models on your specific uh, uh, businesses. And let's take maybe up to five minutes for this. Okay. Right? Thank you. Fantastic. You can stop me because uh, I don't stop talking and that's something a lot of people know about me. Um, hi, my name is Trisha. I've been a workforce strategist for the last seven years across emerging markets in Asia. I think one of the things that we've seen, you know, every company is going through a transformation. I think there's no company right now that says that, oh, we don't want to change and we're very happy with status quo. Um, change management is something that's often an afterthought. You know, if you're investing, you know, $5 million in an ERP system, you'll have $100,000 for a change professional to come in and say, okay, great, how do we make this change happen? The biggest challenge, you know, when it, when, it, when it comes to big companies going through this transformation is the fact that with technology changing, you have to realize that technology is moving a lot quicker uh, than people are, right? And people's mindsets don't change as quickly as your technology does. So the big challenge that you often have when change is an afterthought is the issue of trust. Um, 
you know, just a small example. Uh, when I first started as a change professional, um, I was working with a very big telco company. Um, that invested in a new CRM system, right? So effectively what would happen, and they had a bit of an aging workforce, some from Singapore, um, and that's you know, quite a challenge. Um, so they had you know, a, a fairly aging workforce, and what would happen is ideally what we wanted was they would you know, answer a call, they would type in you know, whatever the query was, everything would be you know, within the CRM system, um, and you know, hopefully you have enough data to do your mining, to be able to figure out um, and have a 360 degree view of the customer. What they started to realize was the return of investment that they were looking at uh, was supposed to be you know, about great efficiency gains of 20, 25%, right? That's what the big companies promise you. Um, they were actually taking twice as long um, to do the same process, which is answer a query, um, you know, have it within the system. Um, so they sent us down and they said, look, you know, we're not getting the gains that we were promised, what's going on? Um, I went, interviewed um, the people. Um, I spoke to this one lady and effectively she was like, look, um, what happens if I type in, you know, all of this data into the system, but it doesn't get tracked, it doesn't get recorded. So what she used to do is she would answer the call, she would write down the, the entire message, after that she would type it in, she would take a printout of that, and she'd make sure she files all of that in because she didn't trust the technology, she didn't trust the system that was there. And that's a huge issue that, you know, that we often see where, yes, at the top level, um, there is, you know, you have great conversations about this is what technology can do, these are the gains that we can get, but that doesn't cascade down to the rest of the workforce. That's why you often don't see transformations being successful, technology transformations being successful. The big difference right now is, you know, when it comes to, Tatiana, your question about unicorn and big companies. In big companies, you've got a very diverse workforce um, that's in play, right? And because of that, while some people are a lot quicker to adapt to the change, you know, um, you know potentially uh, the millennials, uh, you still see that there is, uh, there's a lag um, you know, amongst the other uh, workforce uh, groups. However, in the, the, the unicorn companies and a lot of the startups, what you're going to tend to see is the median age is a lot lower, um, the profile of people that are hired are a lot more similar, and everyone, it, it, they're small enough to be agile and they're small enough to be able to shift and completely, you know, uh, pivot their focus as and when required. So I think, you know, in my perspective, one of the biggest things, um, if we look at the future of the workforce, is changing the way people work is about changing the mindset. In order to change the mindset, that's not an afterthought, that's something where you need to take people on that journey with you, and in order to do that, do it from the get-go, and realize that people are different, embrace that difference, and build that trust if you want to see the return on your investment. Is that less than five minutes? Boom. Thank you very much for such an inspirational introduction, and uh, definitely, I mean, technology is uh, changing really fast, and people are changing slower, if ever, <laughs> Sometimes it takes us long. You know, when we discuss about the technology, I was reading the article and it was saying that we needed 300 years to discover the whole table of Mendeleev, you know, like all of the elements, and now we say the disruption will happen overnight. We, we change slowly. Totally agree with you. And uh, uh, Daniel, uh, you're, uh, what you're doing, you're basically gamifying the experience for companies, so it would be curious if you could just continue the conversation, maybe sharing a little bit uh, on what you do and also um, what do you observe in the industry? What are these changes that are driven by, by tech? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dan, I'm from Singapore. So I used to work in an investment bank for almost a decade, and, but I'm still a millennial, so that's okay. And as a millennial in this investment banking uh, range and fintech, uh, I observed how employment was being changed, uh, was changing, people were getting fired because they couldn't keep in they couldn't keep up with robots that's happening in the bank, um, automation rather. So I eventually started to have this, people needed to be way better than who they could be uh, and, and unlocking their human potential, getting to the best that they can be. But there were a few problems around it, uh, especially things that I face myself internally. How do I know what's happening around? Uh, most of us only see what's in front. We don't know what's happening around us. 
And technology is failing us in that. Like, there's a lot of systems, a lot of tools out there, but we have still no idea what we want to do. You're going to have like Udemy with 10 different courses and you finish one, uh, or you just kind of go through 20% of it. It's hard to know what's, what trends is happening around. It's even harder to find out after you have discovered the trend which of your friends wants to join you in it. You can't go onto Facebook and say, hey, I want to learn AI, who wants to join me? If you go onto LinkedIn and you type the same thing, nobody, nobody cares. Um, you have 10,000 connections, but no one responds to you in a, in a real way. So trying to find out what's happening around um, and then being motivated to pursue that same goal with or without friends is extremely difficult. Um, and, it's, and it's increasingly more difficult for youths given that there's so many different social networks out there trying to distract them. Um, so that's why we thought, you know what, if we were to use some cool new technologies like uh, blockchain, so we use um, tokens uh, as a way to motivate. We see that tokens have very, very strong intrinsic values around helping people to learn, uh, helping people to go green, go, uh, volunteering. We see that there are a lot of these values that we can try and motivate uh, youths to be, more motiv uh, to be more encouraged to take action uh, where they otherwise would not. Uh, so both extrinsic and intrinsic. So we, we, we went towards this uh, and we wanted to use technology as a way, and gaming, and we started to go, you know what, there's in games, you can go, I want to do this quest, this dungeon, and which of my friends or my friend list will join me in that. In that. But we, don't, we can't do that in real life. I, I can't go, I want to do this, who wants to join me in real life? So we thought that it was a good way to bridge the gap between what students could be doing uh, and how they could use that in the workforce. Um, so eventually that's the direction that we are going and we are working with a few schools in Singapore um, to roll this out. So we targeted the, the schools where we felt that there were youths at the highest risk, where they couldn't discover what they want to do and they potentially went off the wrong track. So uh, like the Institute of Technical Education, the Polytechnics in Singapore are the ones that we are working with on projects to try and roll this out. Um, so that's what I'm working on. So if any of you are in, uh, close to the educational institutions around wherever you are from, uh, countries you're in, just feel free to let me know if you think that that's cool and you, you kind of want to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's true, sometimes people think about what they would like to study rather than thinking what they're able to, to do, right? Like how they will be actually having the practical application. And uh, thank you for doing this fantastic work. Gary, I would like to come to you. One of the uh, trends that we observe is uh, the global mobility. And uh, you are being American, you're living in Asia. We haven't discussed, like already for, for quite a bit, right? Living um, in, in different countries and recently in Vietnam. And you're working for a fascinating uh, industry as well. So what are the, uh, what are the changes that you observe uh, on the side of the way of working and uh, maybe around, I don't know, business model? What are, what are these disruptions which are happening in your industry? Or maybe you would like to comment as well. Sure, what thanks. are your observations uh, sure, in terms of the changes in society? Okay, good morning. My name is Kerry Kennedy. I run a company here in Vietnam called Asia Media Partners. Where are basically building out a network of business websites across Asia and setting up our own content studio to produce business-related content. So I'll just make a, a few observations very quickly about media and then um, how the media industry is changing. And basically to understand media and the changes that are happening, I would simply say it's ABCD. That's all you have to remember, ABCD. A stands for artificial intelligence. B stands for the business model, C stands for content, and D stands for data. So let's discuss those very quickly. What is content? Well, what's happening in content? We first of all say that media companies are consolidating, okay? And we worry about the duopoly of Facebook and Google as media companies. But actually look at YouTube, and instead we can see that there's a diversification of media, that everybody becomes a media producer. So there is a consolidation within platforms, but there's not a consolidation of opinions or thought leadership or brand development or education, which is all happening through, again, a platform like YouTube. Um, we also look very interestingly at what we call cross distribution. Originally, if you look back 20 or 30 years ago, if you were watching in the US ABC television, you would never see a video clip coming on ABC that came from NBC or CBS or BBC. Everything was in their own individual content silo. Now, everybody cross-purposes data. 
and cross purposes content. So it's very common to see on NBC them showing a clip from somebody on Fox News and commenting on that, or from the BBC and so on like that. So we start looking at a cross distribution of content. The next part is actually global distribution. Before, content was we knew writers or we knew editors related to our individual newspaper, hometown newspaper, radio, or TV stations. Now, there are people that are known in, on a global basis for their opinions and their thought leadership. So we can see that content in that sense can become global. And I think the next point in content is related to what we would call discovery. Right now, with most of us, um, there's an interesting statistic that people spend about an hour a day searching for the content they want to look at. So you might go to YouTube and say, well, I want to learn about, you know, robotics. And there's 5,000 videos. But which videos do you actually select? So one of the interesting things is that there are now becoming search engines which are very narrow search engines. There's a search engine only for people in biology. So every biology paper, et cetera, like that. So we start looking at how we are discovering and then personalizing our content. So that comes to the next letter, D, which is data. Most people talk about big data, okay? I'm not a believer in big data. Why? Because most people can't even use, most companies can't even use small data. If you are sending me an email that still, still says, Dear Mr. Ms. Perry, because you don't know how Carrie is a male or female name, you have no idea about personalization and your database sucks. Okay? And data is not just this, um, you know, something in the ionosphere, but data equals people. Okay? 20 years ago, I worked in direct marketing, database marketing with McCann, Ogilvy, JWT, companies like that. We worked with American Airlines, we worked with Northwest, we worked with American Express. American Express had over 200 data points on each individual that was a card member, much more than Facebook or Google have. Okay? So data has been being collected in one sense or another. But so when we look at data, it basically comes down to audience measurements, it comes down to content measurement, it comes down to sales or marketing measurement, and it comes down to monetization. Okay? So I want to know more about my audience, I want to know what content they're looking at, I want to know what they're doing with that content, and I want to figure out how to monetize it. Males, okay, 60% of males in here. Credit card holders, mm, probably porno, <laughs> like that. Oh, a few people were laughing, okay, we, we got you already. Okay, so that comes next to the next point, which is A, which is artificial intelligence. I think there are two interesting aspects to artificial intelligence. Four weeks ago in Beijing, Xinhua News just introduced the first AI robotic newscaster, like that. And one of the interesting things, they introduced a male model and a female model that are both based upon actual humans. But with the AI, they're now just doing text to voice. So they don't actually need an announcer 24 hours a day. They have AI robots. And instead, I can just type in what I want my robot to say, male voice, female voice. Now, what's interesting about that is there's also a process in video called deep video. And deep video means basically I can take a six-hour analysis of Barack Obama, let my AI system understand him, facial, everything, how he moves his face, and I can let him deliver the news for you. Okay? And he can be saying, I love Donald Trump. Or I can take Donald Trump, I can take six hours of him, and I can have him saying, there's a, some, there's a woman responsible for all the problems in the world. My mother! Lock her up! Lock her up! Oh, well, maybe that doesn't go too well. But AI is interesting because think about this. Who would you like to deliver your news to you every morning? If you can push on your TV, do you want to see a regular you know, newscaster? Or would you like to have Brad Pitt every morning? Good morning. Hi, here's the daily news for you. Would you like to have Barack Obama delivering your daily news? So in the same way that we can have avatars for ourselves, we can actually determine the newscaster that we most have an affinity for or the personality. Well, what does that mean? Brand integration, affinity, affection, emotion. 
all drivers for finally B, the business model. Okay? So in the internet era, we started with advertising. We kind of went to e-commerce. Now it's all integrated together. Most platforms have more than one revenue stream. They can have advertising, they can have white papers, they can have e-commerce, they can do a number of different things. All of this is changing the technology, but it's not actually, uh, I would disagree with Tricia, disagree with Tricia a little bit when she said, you know, we're looking at technology of how humans can use it. Well, I have a friend back in Hawaii, I'm from Hawaii, I have a friend back in Hawaii who basically his three main things in life are growing weed, smoking weed, and going fishing. Well, he's now learned how to combine that in that he has a fishing tour that allows you to smoke weed on the boat. So he hasn't changed his personality. What he's looked at is how business can fit his personality. And media is the same way. It's becoming more and more personalized, but the basis of media itself is not changing. It's about entertainment, education, and information. And I think if we focus on that, we can see that all of media is changing, but in effect, it hasn't really changed at all. It's just delivering new things. We said television was television because it was a platform in our home. Now television is on our smartphones, our iPads, our devices, our TV sets at home. It's everywhere. Okay, now we don't think of it as television, we think of it as a video and video delivery. So I think it's, the media is changing a lot. It's one of the most important elements in our daily lives and understanding where media is going is important for us as individuals like that because we are the consumers. We're either consumers or producers. In my case, I'm a producer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Very, very interesting. I liked the new definition of the A, B, C, Ds now. Thank you, very fascinating. Would you like um, to also to add from your side, what are your observations uh, on the market? Hi, good morning. My name is Zihan. I'm um, originally from Singapore, but living in the Philippines. So I run a company called Bagosphere. Um, and let's just do a very quick pop quiz. How long does it take a college graduate in the Philippines to land a full-time job? Six months, I'm hearing six months. One year. How long does it take a high school graduate to land a full-time job? Three years. Three years to land a full-time job in the Philippines. I'm not sure whether it's the same in Vietnam or Indonesia, but in the Philippines it's that long, if you're a high school graduate. Uh, so what, what we have done is to, as Bagosphere, as a company, is to bring that down to 10 weeks. And we do that through developing short programs, some people will call it boot camps, uh, to upgrade digital skills as well as what I call inner technology. So your core beliefs, your social emotional skills, so that they could enter the workforce as adaptive and reliable to their employers. Uh, so we have done that over the last six years, uh, worked with companies to help develop curriculum uh, and train uh, this year about 1,200 students um, in, uh, in over the last 12 months. Um, I think my observation about the future of work is that we need to bring preschool, we need to bring the kindergarten back into the classroom. Um, you know, when we go to preschool back in the day, we, we had fun. Um, it was all about play. Uh, we didn't understand what, what you know, we didn't, we're not studying the what. We were studying the why. And I think we're really missing this, in, especially in higher education. And if you notice that as we grow older, as we go through a formal education, the K-12 system, you know, and then subsequently going to college, we are learning the what. Um, and I see a lot of disconnect happening on the ground um, across all levels, at high school, at college levels. And it's a fundamental disconnect in the human being um, between the mind and the body, and as well as the heart. Um, and I think this is the disconnect that we don't talk a lot. I think we talk a lot about digital skills. We talk a lot about cognitive skills. Um, but I see, and we talk about millennials, right? The reason why they are so lazy and they're not motivated. Um, and I think it's fundamentally not just a shift in terms of how technology has driven, but also how education systems have not adapted to how the mind really works. And I think it's core to address that um, because if we want to have human beings doing work that 
AI can't do, that machines can't do, we need to unlock that. Uh, and I think the sooner that we think about how we can bring preschool back into higher education, um, you know, we'll be in a better place to, to try to address those issues. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to also to invite those who are participating in the panel as, um, as guests. If you would like to comment or to ask questions, please uh, feel free. Uh, you're very much welcome. Because I think, you know, uh, as, a, as a joint intelligence in the room, we can bring much more value all together. So just, you know, feel free to, to jump in into, into the conversation. You wanted to share something? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment from what Zihan said, which is that I'm not sure if our, especially in a media-driven world, if education is at all, can be taught at all in the same way from a classroom. And I remember very famously Bill Gates and Davos saying, I don't care if you say you have a PhD in computer programming or if you're a high school student. At Microsoft, we give you a programming test. You either pass or you don't. And we don't really care about the degree. What we care about is the skill. Now, we know that already through some testing that taking AI, robotics, with education can increase learning up to 10 times faster, like that, especially when whoever is teaching us robotically has that, as I said earlier, that affinity that we like. If you were, you know, remember that four-year-old or five-year-old kid who's looking at Mickey Mouse and loving Mickey Mouse, and if Mickey is talking to him every day, telling him about how to learn like that, if you're using that from the artificial intelligence, if you're really finding out what the, the, the psychographics of an individual are, you can change the entire process of learning. And we see it in language, we see it in a lot of other areas, and that again comes back to how are you using media like that to deliver content, in this case, education content like that. And how are you reinforcing it? Is it, oh, I'm taking a paper test and one plus one equals two and two plus one. You know, it's like when I study Japanese and we start going through you know, this is a black pencil, this is a blue pencil, this is a green pencil, this is a yellow pencil. And somebody from the back of my classroom yells to the teacher, I use a pen. And somebody else says, yeah, I type. I didn't care about, we didn't care about the blue and the green and the yellow. So what was the essence, right? Or was the essence talking about colors? Okay, so you have to understand what it is. And I think that that in the sense of sitting in a classroom six hours, eight hours a day, trying to learn is really almost anti where youth are going, how they're absorbing information, and how they pass information back. And if we understand that, that's why I said technology, it's not, I think, molding humans to technology, it's looking to say, like my friend back in Hawaii, how is he using technology for what he wants, like that. And when you match that, then you have a very powerful, I think, platform, especially in education. I, I totally agree that I think we need to relook at the, at the system, the education system per se, you know, and, and, and look at it not as a, a place of learning where learning stops after you get a, a degree or a certificate. Um, and instead of an education system, we should think of it as a, as a human learning system across the entire lifetime. Uh, and so maybe that's where media plays a, a role. To, to do that continuously. I think it's just a conceptual thing. We kind of grew up saying, okay, you're gonna go through high school, and when you graduate high school, you're there for certain types of jobs. And if you wanna do more, you go to college. And if you do that, then you go to your master's and your PhD and so on like that. And again, it's not to say that learning is like in a 12 year or 16 year process, but it becomes a lifelong I mean, how many of us have looked at YouTube to find out, oh, how can I use Excel better? How can I use some software better? How can I use my camera better? Because there's all these instructional videos. And we have to get into this mind that it's a lifelong learning. But again, I think if we look at where the technology, the AI, the robotics can help us learn, then that's the really interesting part. Um, it's a very, and very interesting, absolutely, around. and uh, I was listening to this, I was exactly thinking about this life learning concept, right, because if before we were thinking that kind of the jobs were kind of linear and it was very predictable, then today, I mean, the companies come and go very, very quickly, and then uh, 
I mean, we're changing jobs now. If before you were changing jobs more than uh, once every five years, it was considered to be job hopping, right? Yeah. Today, uh, when you speak to people, and like when I speak to, um, to, to young people who would like to, to pursue the degree, and yeah. I'm asking, for, <laughs> uh, for, how many, you know, for how many years do you see yourself doing the same job? You could rarely see hands beyond two years. I mean, they think that two years is a very normal thing, and it's already called the job, how they say it in the, in the UK, right? Like, oh, two years, it's already a job. Um, so, um, what we observe from the educational uh, um, industry is that actually, if before the MBA was something, it was a master's degree, which you would do when you were just finished your BBA. In Europe, it's a bit older, so it's like the average age is 29. What we see is that the, we will get in our life at least three the kind of three degrees before we'll go into the management degree. So every seven years, at least, we would need to be re-educating ourselves, pampering the skills which would have to do with the hard skills. Uh, so with, with the base of knowledge and the average age of the MBA student by 20, uh, 50, we think is going to be 60 years versus 29 that we observe today. And on top of that, we see that there will be like the memory enhancing pills, you know, and all these things which enable us to learn quicker and, and faster. Now, I have a nine year old daughter. And uh, when you're thinking about it, like what are the evolving jobs of the future? I have no idea, you know, what she will do when she's graduating and she's going for the university. I'm a strong believer in the power of soft skills. And I'm a strong believer into the, uh, in, you know, in, into the language skills. So that's why she's speaking four languages. And the fifth one that she's learning now is actually programming. So she has her classes of robotics and uh, she's programming in, in Scratch. So what I wanted, to, the question that I would like to pose, and also, I mean, um, everyone who is here, if you would like to comment, please feel free to join. Uh, with the dynamics that we observe that are happening on the market uh, and the industries, uh, what would be the top three skills that we today, across all generations, millennials, Zs, uh, Ys, As, that we have to make sure that we have to be able to compete and collaborate and to be successful? And I don't know who of you would like to, to open. So what would be those like top skills, top three <laughs> skills that you think all of us have to ensure that we continuously develop today? to be able to be successful in, in the coming years? So, I mean, just my perspective, Tatiana, I think it's a mixture of three types of skills. Um, one is, you know, the technical skills, which is exactly what Kerry has also been talking about, you know, making sure that you're on top of the game when it comes to AI, when it comes to robotics, when it comes to all of that. And that, that's going to constantly evolve. The two that I think are, you know, regardless of the technology, regardless of anything that will continue to happen, one would be leadership. You know, leadership skills are imperative. And leadership skills are changing um, in today's day and age where, you know, it's not so much as uh, I know everything and, you know, how can I make sure I guide this, but leadership skills in terms of how do I build impact and relevance in the people that are below me. And that, to me, is effectively building the social capital that, you know, across, um, across the companies that you're with. Um, and the other one, exactly to a point, is soft skills. And I think the biggest one is empathy. Um, empathy is it's such an underrated skill, uh, but it's so imperative because, you know, exactly to your point, previously when people would work in a company, uh, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, they would go through their lives, you know, they'd go through big milestones in their lives, you know, getting married, having a kid, um, all of that within the same company. Right now, um, you know, just some of, if you look at some of the studies, millennials feel that in the case that they're going through a big milestone shift, they actually need to switch companies because they need that time off because they need uh, to be able to go out, do their thing, get married, take six months off, go travel, after that come back, switch into a new job. But if as employers, uh, you know, we, we actually were a lot more empathetic and that's, some, that's a skill that was actually built across. And, you know, don't get me wrong, empathy is not, oh, you know, sorry, you know, your cat died, take two years off, or, you know, take two weeks off, absolutely not. But just being cognizant um, of, 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 of other people and what they're going through, I think that is quite imperative um, in the coming world. Anyone wants uh, to add Future. to that? <laughs> <coughs> Well, I, I will take a spin on that question um, 
to narrow down on just one skill, I think we need to learn better, uh, which is to learn how to teach better. Um, one of, a lot of the issues why the education system hasn't really caught up to the work is, is that, frankly speaking, uh, teachers are you know, not equipped uh, to deal with the change that we see. Uh, and so one of the things that we do uh, as an organization, and we train, help, we help, the, we help teachers unlearn what they have learned doing teaching, is to how to teach the problem and not the tools. So to teach the problem and not the tools. So when I was in college, uh, I had this professor, and he's the most boring kind of guy in the classroom. I mean, I would be sleeping by the time he opened his mouth. And, but he gave us a lot of challenges. So one day he said, all right, you're learning electromagnetics, you're learning you know, how, to, uh, how, how the systems work. And he said, build working groups, build a, build a way to detect. Now I've hidden, the professor said, I've hidden a wireless router within 10 kilometers of the school. Build a wireless antenna to find that within 10 kilometers. And so we had to work in teams, we had to work in groups, we had to compete, um, we had to research, we had to build the whole thing. And the team and I, we ended up building something like a space blaster and we were running around the school trying to find that router. And eventually we did. Within two kilometers, we were able to connect and have an internet connection with that router. Um, and so it was just an amazing experience. And what I mean by teaching the problem is that you unlock, you unlock the very human, uh, you know, innate uh, desire to solve problems. Uh, and if you want to teach a kid uh, rocket science, you don't teach the physics and the math. I mean, all those things are important. But it's much better to say, build a rocket to go from the ground floor to the third floor. And because you need to do that, you need to, you need to solve that challenge, you've got to learn math, physics, science, and so on and so forth. Um, and in a way, in our classrooms, when we teach customer service, we don't teach them the language skills. We don't teach them the grammar rules, even though you know, that's really important. But we, we say, the teacher walks in the classroom and say, today you're going to learn how to deal with an irate customer. And that immediately unlocks a very different part of the brain, right, to deal with a problem. And because you need to deal with that, you know, that scenario of dealing with this very irate customer, you not just have to learn the language skills, you've got to learn empathy, uh, you've got to learn um, you know, stress management, um, assertiveness, and a whole lot of other soft skills that are, a bit, that are a lot more holistic than just learning very siloed topics like grammar, pronunciation, and so on and so forth. Can I add? So, on, on, I really like the part about um, teaching, um, mentoring, coaching. So, I have, I just over the last weekend, I have, I have this niece. She's like two, three years old, and she barely can speak. Um, but what, what, what happened was, uh, so we were going out of a uh, shopping mall, and there was this bicycle that dropped on the floor, like just drop, and she was, and she was like, oh, bicycle drop, pick it up. And just natural, she just does it, like she just learns it from, I think my, my, my brother, that's her father, and she just picks it up, like she observes that something bad happens and just, just do something about it. So my brother was saying, she's so smart. But I felt that there was something kind of missing there. I, I was like, okay, that's really good if you are just two years old, you can't even speak, but you can observe something bad is happening and you want to try and correct it. Um, so my brother was always teaching it that way, that hey, something bad happened, do something about it. Uh, but the, the thing that is not right about that is you're teaching a, a kid how to react, but not really, so there's this react and respond. You don't really respond. Um, so for, for what I was sharing with my brother was maybe you should teach the child why, uh, the, the, the why question. Why do you want to pick up the bicycle after it drops? Um, and, and it could be different reasons. So eventually we kind of like, okay, you know what? It could be about safety. You want to teach your child about safety. That you know what? If this drops, somebody else might trip on it. So you should pick it up. So we, you, and you kind of want to constantly add, like kind of plant this seed in a person's mind to always ask why. Why do I have to pick it up? And, and that carries on, especially when you're young. Um, so, and, and that itself, even when you are doing work, so personally, myself, we are working on, um, so we're trying to kind of growth hack our Twitter. So we, we, we get data out of Twitter, and there's a lot of integrations, and I have to constantly figure out how do I help my, my staff um, manage replies and engagement in a, in, a, in a data-centric way. So pulling out data and then automating stuff. And then I found out, oh, right, oh there are some cool tools that can automate um, this, this data to uh, a tool for machine learning. And I, if, if, I had, 
if, if I didn't keep on asking the question on how can I and why, uh, why is this required and those kind of questions, that it, it wouldn't, then now I'm, now I'm watching videos about machine learning. Um, and it comes from the belief that, that I can do anything. There's nothing, there's nothing that I cannot do. Uh, and, and that's something that, that I learned a lot from um, like Steve Jobs, who, who famously mentioned that um, no one in the world is, is, I mean, everything that we hear about us, everything that we, we everyone that people teach us, especially in school, like geography, um, like why do plates move? Well, we, we all know like plate tectonics, it moves, but no one knows why. Uh, and the way that it is being taught to us in school is that that's how the way works. I mean, that's how the world works. And the problem with that sometimes is, I as a student, I don't understand why, but I feel that I'm stupid, that I cannot do it. Because that's, that's what I felt when I was in school. Like, I'm stupid. I, I, I don't understand why. And, and if I ask my teacher why, my, my teacher will say, you don't understand? Are you stupid? And, and then that passes down to my parents, who would then tell me, hey, you are stupid. You got a C6 for your geography. And, and, but that, that is destructive. Uh, in theory, we should always be asking why. So Steve Jobs made one really good example there. So he took a water bottle and dropped it on the floor. He just dropped it down on the floor. And he asked, why does that happen? Nobody, knows, nobody in the world knows why. We know how to describe it. We even have a name for it. But no one knows why. And we should be asking our, I mean, people to kind of think about, you know what, what our teachers tell us, they have no idea either. They're just telling us what they know. And, and in work, especially true, your bosses don't know either and you have to help your bosses. And that's, that, those are kind of things that I think people will have to, to, be, uh, to be good about uh, and not just doing. That's what I think. Sir Shen, can I ask you a question? I think you raised a very good point. Sorry, this is one question. Um, is, you know, you're talking about observe and respond, right? And, and, and that's great. A lot of people do the first part. They say, oh, there's something wrong about it, but is it really my responsibility? You know, I think one of the challenges that companies have is this whole idea of diffusion of responsibility, where everyone sees there's a problem. We all know it's happening. I mean, you know, as a management consultant, you, you go into any company, there's three problems. You have your silos, you're not getting your return on investment, you know, you, you have the same problems everywhere. But there's a huge diffusion of responsibility, so everyone can observe, but no one does something about it. So, you know, in your perspective, how do we, as we talk about the future of workforce, how do we bring about that shift? And I think sure. asking the why is very important, but how do you actually get into the next step so that I, something happens? I think in bigger organizations where you have so many different departments, and most of the time they just tell you that I don't, wanna, I don't want, like, I'm too busy. And I always had that when I try and call up my finance department, they're like, I'm too busy with my life. Forget it. Don't, don't, don't call me. But we are working on the same project. Um, but it's partially also how, um, if there was a central coordinator, how is the guy trying to drive everyone along the journey? So my boss always, was always saying that, that our work is kind of like a bus ride. So we are the bus driver. And as we go along from journey from here to the end, there will be people who are coming on board the journey, and then the people who will be getting off the, the bus, right? and your goal is to get them to their destination. Um, and, and so having to have that, if you are the central coordinator, having that mindset that, that your job is to facilitate, uh, but also kind of, depending on which angle, if you are the person that is kind of stuck and you have to do it, and you're using your own soft skills to try and solve that problem, then you have to negotiate uh, and find a way through uh, influence. But if you are the management, then there is the need to try and um, facilitate this either by, form, either by coming up with ways to... S so like for me, what we have done in our system is we put up a, a platform where uh, we can crowdsource problems. So we put up a, ch a challenge statement and anybody in the company can get matched to solve a problem that they want to solve. So it, regardless whether they are finance, operations, settlements, uh, what will happen is you, you, you see this challenge, you know what, I want to solve Grab's UX problem. Um, and you call up someone from product team, someone from technology team, hey, there's this problem, you want to solve it together. So it becomes a team-based effort and not just, hey, you know what, I'm just doing my job. So that's, that's what I... What I, what I s you know, I, I just want to say both to Zihan and Shen, see, conceptually, I think it's all turned around. I think you're 180 degrees, I hate to say wrong, but you're wrong. The question is not about how to teach. The most important thing we can do is teach people how to learn. Yeah. Okay. 
because teaching sounds very, you know, it's like very linear in that sense that everything comes from top and all knowledge is coming down. But knowledge is changing in the world and earth and everything, technology is all changing so quickly. So to me, if we were going to talk about the three things that people need to learn, and especially in Southeast Asia and the Mekong region, which is what I focus on, it would be how to learn, it'd be developing, it'd be understanding that each and every individual is their own brand, okay, whatever that stands for, and ultimately teaching something about entrepreneurship. And the reason for that is that 90% of the jobs between now and 2050 across Southeast Asia are going to come from small and medium enterprises. So if you're not teaching from the very beginning or from the very beginning, you're not learning about business and you're not thinking about, you know, there's not a company that's going to employ me for 30 or 40 years. I'm a graphic designer. I need to find out how to build business from 500 different sources. So I have to learn how to do that. I have to develop my brand and then I have to learn how to market and sell it. And that's all related together. And it can't be just that somebody is sitting there telling you, you know, this is how a computer works. No, it's like, yes, let us show you instead, teach you how to, in the sense of teaching, or let us open up the world of possibilities to you by letting a child learn with a computer and then let them go where they want to go like that. And sorry, if you're not interested in math, then you know, trying to force someone to learn math is not necessarily the best use of their time, and you're probably just tuning, tuning that person out like that. So again, if we can use technology to find out what humans themselves are interested in, everything comes together faster. But, but Kerry, can I just ask, sorry, uh, but Kerry, can I ask you one thing? You know, I think there's a big difference in, you know, yesterday Stacy and I, we were, we were discussing it. In the States, you've got, a, you know, the whole idea of contingent workforce is quite big. And people are open to the fact where, you know, I'm a great UX, UI person, and, you know, I can work for 10 different companies, and I can freelance for them. Whereas in Asia, and especially in emerging markets, the whole idea of having a stable job and having a nine to five, being on a payroll, you know, there's a little bit of that, that, aver that aversion to risk um, taking, right? With what you're saying, I, I, I do agree with you. I take your point where, you, you know, it'd be fantastic to say, okay, this is what I'm good at, but maybe I'm not going to be employed in one company because you don't really need that skill set. 88% uh, of 28-year-olds in Vietnamese males working in companies say they want to quit as soon as possible, start their own companies. So right. when you have 80... How many of them do it? When you have, huh? How many of them do it? Increasingly, an, an increasing number. Whether they're doing it today or whether it's going to happen tomorrow, my point is they're not sitting there thinking, oh, IBM, great, I want to work here for the next 30 years. Of course. Instead, they're sitting like, okay, I'm interested in AI, I'll learn what I can from IBM, and then I want to start my own company doing AI or something like that with two of my <coughs> friends. I want to control my destiny. The problem with most of those people, just like restaurants, as they say, is that 90% of them close because you don't know how to run the business part. And that's why I said it also has to be teaching or letting people understand that, you know, in a, in a gig economy, in a digital economy, your customer can be from Europe, can be from wherever at the same time. How are you going to communicate exactly. with them. How are you going to get the money? How are you going to get the business happening? That's an entrepreneurship. And that's great. Entrepreneurship is great for corporate entities also. You know? I see that we would like, uh, we have someone who would like to join the conversation. Uh, thanks. I'm Phil O'Reilly from New Zealand. Um, the, the, title, the title is Asia's Future of Work, and we just started getting to it a minute ago, which, which is helpful. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the research and writing around the future of work is, of course, dominated by authors and academics and business people from the United States and Europe. That's fair enough. Of course, that's very different to Asia. Uh, uh, and I'm interested in, in any thoughts people have around what Asia's future of work looks like that's different to the future of work we so often read about, apparently some sort of Silicon Valley for the world. Let me give you two examples. One is... Uh, when you think about Europe 
you know, Europe is much more rules focused and rules dominated, much more focused on borders despite the EU, much more focused by uh, concerns about job loss, much more concerned about stranded assets, both human and capital assets of one sort or another. Uh, and therefore interested in lots of rules because the Europeans like rules about how to change and what, what people will do and, and, and inclusion and that sort of stuff. Those words dominate the debate. Um, in, in Asia, much more, I speak uh, simplistically, but nevertheless in Asia, much more conversation about opportunity. And the reason is that the countries here are much more least developed and, and, uh, and middle income uh, or just developing economies. Uh, so that must play out differently in terms of how people think about a future of work. The other thing that interests me is the, the idea that there's all sorts of opportunities in a future of work scenario for countries to leapfrog. Uh, in developed economies, we spent a century putting in place poles and wires to carry electricity around and to carry digital around. Lots of new countries don't have to do that in quite that way. Lots of Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia simply won't have to do that. They can install new technology and leapfrog the massive investments that those developed economies have made. All of that, no doubt, has big implications for the future of work. I'm interested in any thoughts that people have on that. I've just written uh, some articles on, on Mekong region, so specifically Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam in the future of 4IR, what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And it's not going to happen in Asia, at least within the 640 million people of the ASEAN grouping of 10 countries, in the way that it's happening in the US or Europe, because Vietnam does not want to leapfrog to smart manufacturing where you're displacing workers like that. So it is going to come on slower in across Mekong, especially in Indonesia, like that, than in then what you're looking at in the US, Europe, China, Japan, South Korea, like that. And so you're going to be looking at almost a water flow system like that. But you know, the question, the biggest problem right now comes back to the education cycle. In Vietnam, as an example, it takes between three and four years for a new textbook, for a new education course to be developed. So businesses go to the government, they say, these are the skills we need for our workers. Teach these in university. The government then says to a bunch of scholars, create academic materials for us, we'll approve them, that takes a year. Okay, now we're publishing, we're printing the books and so on like that. It's taken three years for four years to get it into a distribution cycle. By that time, the job skills are totally gone, like that. Or, or the, the, what's, what's needed is totally different. So we're good, so, you know, certain things, I think, in terms of technology, you know, there's, Singapore has what's called the Digital ASEAN Initiative, and basically they're pushing all of the countries of ASEAN to try to move digitally as quickly as possible. And so we say there's about 125,000 new people every day coming on digitally in the ASEAN grouping like that, which is 50 million new people a year. That, that's a lot of people. Um, that's where education, that's where a lot of other things are going to be delivered from, from those type of platforms like that. Whether, again, those are government approved platforms or whether it's just, again, get out there like on YouTube and learn, learn, learn is a different question. What the structure is going to be, you know, and what, what does that need, you know, if you're not going to a school, you don't get a paper certificate. So what, do, what, what are, how are you going into the job? So I think, again, jobs will become like skill set, skill focused, testing and so on like that. Again, like uh, Bill Gates saying, he doesn't care if you say you're a PhD or a university or a high school graduate, take the test. If you pass, you get a job at Microsoft. You don't pass, whatever, go on like that. It's so not, it's not going to be the, uh, the big jump the way Europe or the US talks. So I've, I've, I've got a grant from the Singapore government, um, so I can talk a little bit about how Singapore's um, multi-stat boards are come. So th there's, there's so many different um, stat boards in Singapore, right? And, and almost every one of those has a human capital department. And they're all trying to figure out how can we get Singaporeans to be more digital and ready for the future. And they, they even created a skills future uh, arm just to do that. So. So it's, but that part is kind of government. Uh, and from my perspective, it's very powerful because I've got a grant from Enterprise Singapore. And 
when I go across different countries, they, I meet up with their director in the country and they, they try and leapfrog me. So essentially, and then, and then what I found out is there are like 37 different offices for uh, Enterprise Singapore around Asia. There's like four in Africa. I was like, wow. So I could literally go to Africa and, and meet up with like different offices for Enterprise Singapore and, and get resources there. So but what, what I'm trying to say there is um, different countries in Singapore, I, I, rather different countries in Asia, uh, especially Singapore, I think is trying to, trying to lead the way they are very, very, and there are even grants that, that we can get um, to hire uh, graduates uh, and they give us a, a, a amount that is discounted. Is that the right word anyway? So, so, so I think um, we have a few of those in Singapore that if you're interested, I can share more. Yeah, the problem with using Singapore as, as the model is Singapore is the most technologically advanced country yeah, exactly. in Asia exactly. in, uh, or, or in one, one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. And you can't use it when comparing it to Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. Sure. And you can't yeah. say that the Singapore model of what, what has been done in education and jobs is going to work in Myanmar when the average education is sixth sure. grade. But I think his question was, what is it like in yeah. Asia? Right? But again, that comes to my point, which is that that same person in Myanmar who only has that sixth grade education, if they have been taught in some way, or if they understand how they can continue to learn, and then that's going to be the key. Sure. I mean, that, that, that so, solves so every, the problem. Yeah. So, I mean, when we talk yeah. about changing from regular manufacturing to smart new ma manufacturing, you know, what are you going to do with 300,000 Samsung workers in Vietnam if Samsung wants to go to smart manufacturing? They're not all going to be computer programmers. They're not all going to be maintenance people. So, you know, the Vietnamese government is saying, we're not going to give you the grants and the money to set up factories in Vietnam if it's 100% smart manufacturing where you're displacing jobs like that. We'll give you those grants and we'll give you those money and we'll give you those tax credit when it's human capital like that. Because that's their, their goal here is to put people to work. Morning. Uh, can I come in? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about skills. Uh, one thing that I, I find uh, increasingly a problem uh, for younger people coming up to the workforce is mental strength. I think um, we all hear about uh, young, young, young people, whether they are graduates or high school or even in, in middle school, going for counseling. I think that's a big gap in our education system across the world. We are not teaching um, the young to manage themselves. Hmm. And so when they come out, yes, they got the skills of um, IT or whatever, but they don't have life skills. And this is a big issue because we find the burnout rate um, too high. So companies are investing in young people to come in and only to find that they get burned out. Now, teaching people life skills uh, and teaching them how to adapt, it's a big miss. I just wanted some feedback on you guys. No, you know, I would absolutely agree with you. When I was recruiting, uh, you know, for a big four seven years ago, and you'd ask someone, why do you want to be a management consultant? The, you know, most graduates would come and say, oh, you know, we want the breadth of experience. We want to understand, you know, what it is. Now, you, you know, you ask someone, uh, just a few months ago, I was recruiting someone, and they said, oh, because I want to be able to tell a CEO how they can change their business. And I said, mate, you're 21 years old. How are you going to tell the CEO? <laughs> I was like, and you know, you've, you've got to love the ambition. You've got to love the drive and the motivation. But I completely take your point. I think that resilience, that perseverance, um, which is such a key skill, the, the knowing that it's okay if you're photocopying, you know, uh, for the first three months, everyone has to go through the steps that it takes, uh, you know, to get anywhere in any profession, whether it's media, whether it's, you know, whether it's consulting, uh, you know, whether it's technology, there is the boring stuff which will come. Um, and, and I think that is something where a part of it does get a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, iffy, simply because people look at all these success, these success stories, right? You look at a snapshot, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, you take a, a, a five second video and that CEO, you know, becomes a billionaire and who would have thought, you know, you start a Tinder and a swipe left, a swipe, a swipe right and, you know, the person becomes a billionaire. 
but everyone is now going all the you know i think there's definitely this with entrepreneurship definitely resilience is important but people have this dream of we want to make it big we want to make it big we want to make it big really really quickly uh, because you you know all of this is really publicized uh, but i completely take your point that resilience is very important to even to get you successful in any industry yep so we don't talk enough about failures i think entrepreneurship yeah. is built on the fact that nine people fail and one person succeeds right but we don't talk about it we don't talk about failures and how we get over that yeah. but you know there's also kind of this idea um ted you know the ted talks they did some very interesting what they call uh, you know neurological study and they say well you know the average attention span of a young youth today is very very limited compared to the old days when we used to sit there with our textbooks reading hour after hour and then somebody said, yeah, well, give them a Game Boy. Yeah. They won't get off of it for the next three days. So again, it's like fitting people in to the technology and then letting them know how to explore and develop from the technology. And, you know, I think ideas come from the top down, but they also bubble up, right? So, you know, there's nothing to say that sometimes a younger person might look at it and say, you know, but why are we doing it that way? Why, are, you know, and so that questioning, this, so that's why I said, you know, if we are teaching people how to learn, then we're sparking curiosity. And to me in education, that's the most important point. It's not saying, you know, it's like, how do you learn? How do you, you know, if somebody doesn't understand math, if they don't understand science, how do you get them to want to understand it? That's the question, right? Like, I really hated chemistry when I was in junior high school until some friends of mine and I actually made a bomb. You know, and we didn't know what we were doing. We were just playing after school, and all of a sudden, this thing started bubbling, and, you know, and it's like, oh, shit, what is this? We threw it down the, the, the toilet and it actually exploded like that. But you know what? The next day, we were spending hour after hour, week after week, so like, how can we make that bomb again? How can we do it? So it really sparked curiosity, right? So that's all I'm saying is that, is that, you know, we can use media, we can use technology, we can use all of these things that are happening to really spark curiosity. And I think that's the goal, because if we do that, then people want to learn continuously. You know, we always see these stories on TV like, oh, this guy went back to university, he's 90 years old and he graduated, you know, finally. And we go, wow, that sounds so special. But why isn't it ha that happening every day? That should be the daily norm, that people are not amazed that somebody goes back to school and gets a degree or somebody continues to learn something. That's just, again, this lifelong learning that we've got to get into. It's a Excuse very me. excellent point, and I think you wanted to comment. We have the last comment, yeah, oh, and then we would need to wrap up. No, so, so <laughs> I, I actually didn't want to ask this question because we're getting towards the end, but I'm actually happy you brought up the 90 year going back to school. So everyone's talking about textbooks and youth, of course, they are the future. But what about this other, I wouldn't say problem, but there is an aging population as well. Uh, we're going to live a longer life. Uh, there's even statistics that say if you're born after a certain uh, date, there's a 50, 60 percent probability that you're going to live till 100. So you're going to have to reinvent yourself. They're going to, you're going to have multiple careers. So is that a real problem in Asia as well? Because I know in Europe it is. And people are looking at that, exponential learning. How can we have different formats? How can we get people to reskill themselves? Is, is that being looked at as seriously in Asia as it is. In Europe, for, for, for the aging population as much as for the youth, because there's a lot happening for the youth. Let me just, I know we're, we're short of time, but my name is Arnaud Meyer, and I'm the president of Singapore Management University, in Singa again in Singapore. Uh, I just wanted to make a footnote before I uh, commented is that I've heard a lot about how bad we do in education and how universities are inflexible. I can reassure you that also we change, uh, yeah. Yeah. right? And sometimes I, when I hear people in, in meetings like this in general talking about how bad university education is, they probably talk about their university education of 20 years ago. We don't talk anymore about mobile phones of 20 years ago uh, as if they are not good, right? So also universities have changed 
and I could go on for long how we do that at Singapore Management University. But the point I really wanted to make is when you talk about the future of work, it is extremely difficult to predict what it will be. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough to remember the predictions of the mid-70s about the future of work. And in the mid-70s in Europe, it was very clear that we would have a work week of two days per week. The reality is more people work than in the 70s and they work longer. Uh, so it's actually quite difficult to predict how work will evolve. The four points that I've heard here, but that I would like to reinforce is, we all will work longer, that I am convinced of. Uh, secondly, we all, part of our job will be digitized. Jobs will not disappear. I mean, there is this study in Oxford that accountancy would disappear because it's all gonna be solved by uh, AI. Yeah, it's true that we don't have push carts anymore either and that we have far less uh, horse riders uh, to do deliveries. But yeah, the, the job of accountancy will not disappear. It will be just a different job. So it's going to be more dig digitized. We, as you pointed out, will have to change more. Uh, in other words, we have, will have multiple careers. And fourthly, as you said, um, we will have to continue to learn during our job. But that is one of the biggest challenges because, frankly speaking, we don't know how to do adult learning. We know very well how to teach in a, a kid or a young man and young woman of 22 years old. We don't know how to teach that 65-year-old or that 55-year-old very well. We have some clues, but we don't know very well. And we, re we really need to make a lot of um, uh, research on that. But if these four trends are clear, longer, more digitized, more change and multiple careers, and we have to engage in adult learning, um, I, also, I only see one way of going, and that is much more experiential learning, much more project-based learning. Uh, coming back to what Kerry said, uh, teaching our students how to learn, learning how to learn. Because when, when parents, usually it's parents in Singapore, come up to me and say, what should my son or daughter study and what kind of elective they should take? I, I say, let them do what they lo like to do. I really have no clue what they have to study because I don't know what they will need in 10 years from now. But I know one thing for sure, they will do projects and they will have to learn how to learn from those projects. So go for a course that helps you to learn to le how to learn. And that's the point I really wanted to make. Thank you very much for the wonderful uh, summary and just taking maybe a few minutes to, to wrap up. Um, and thank you for bringing the, the point uh, about the work week because that was exactly what I was thinking that today, you know, the 40 hour kind of uh, work week has been based on the uh, industry, industry, right? Because people were working in shifts and we were structured, I don't know, five days and two days. However, we are more and more immersed into kind of living and learning at the same time. We observe more like co-working, co-living uh, exercises and uh, we work virtually. So just, uh, you know, as, as a wrap up, I would like to do a little bit of prediction here with my dear panelists. What do you think would be the length of the working week? And what do you think will be the percentage of time that will be working presential face to face with colleagues and blended, meaning by the means of the technology? And maybe we start with you, Jihan. Well, I think we're not going to work lesser, we're going to work more. I think that's, that's um, yeah, I, I, see, I see people want to have a good life. Um, and if work can give them a good life, they will work for it. Um, and, but whether that is going to happen to their kids you know, or not is a different question altogether. Um, I do see that there's a lot more, um, you know, the gig economy is going to grow in, in Asia. Um, in the Philippines, we work a lot with the call centers, the business processing, outsourcing companies. But you know, a lot of the students, a lot of the people that go into these centers don't want to work for a call center for the rest of their lives. Um, and a lot of them want to transition out um, and think in, in a country like the Philippines where it's so distributed, um, having very flexi work arrangements, being a virtual assistant, being um, a Adobe uh, InDesign uh, person is something that's very agreeable, especially, especially to women. Um, and I think that's a great force of, um, of, of uh, transfer from, from the men to the women. And now women are much more empowered. Uh, I think that's a great thing for, for any economy. Um, I think we're gonna work longer 
sometimes, and I think we're going to work sh shorter sometimes. I think it becomes more flexible that when you are project-based, you work your ass off. If you need to do it 80 hours this week, you do it 80 hours this week, and next week you take off and you go to the beach. And, you know, like uh, Professor DeMeyer said, you know, I think the, the quality is like swimming. You know, I'm from Hawaii, like I said, so the first thing from when we're six weeks old, they start throwing you into the swimming pool, they take you to the beach, and once you know how to swim, you can swim, you can surf, you can scuba dive, you can do all these things, right? And so that to me is analogous to how do you learn? And once you get that going, and once you spark that curiosity, we're going to see amazing things, right? You know, it's like somebody got Mark, you know, Michael Phelps into swimming, and then eight, 15 gold medals later, right? You know, that's the passion, right? And that's what we have to focus on. And I think, you know, there's gonna be people that, you know, one of the interesting things I think also is that I actually know a company in Saigon which is now starting a employment company, but only for people 60 years and above, like that. And they're helping companies to connect to senior executives who may be retired in theory, but who still want to work like that. And I think that's going to be an interesting trend also that we're not just looking at the 22 year old graduates, but we may be saying, yeah, you know, okay, you know, Professor DeMeer, you know, I want to get him on a consulting project. I want to get somebody else on a consulting project. And if they're 60 years old or 70 years old, but if they're the best I can get, then I don't care. And that's the gig economy. That's the entrepreneurship that's happening more and more, especially in Asia again. I think once Asia starts shifting more towards that contingent, and exactly what you were talking about, Kerry, uh, a much more kind of squad-based approach to how you're going to get outcomes for a project or how, as a company, you know, I want A and B and how do I get the right people. Moving from that full-time economy, uh, you know, sort of employment to a contingent workforce, will allow that flexibility. I don't think work-life balance is something where, you know, I'm gonna work for eight hours and chill for another eight. That's not gonna happen, but you will have your, your crazy 80 hours, uh, you know, sort of work weeks, and then, you know, you, t you take your two, week, your, your two weeks off. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a real shift in mindset uh, of employers. Because yes, your employees might want to do that, but a lot of times the challenge that you see is people say, oh yeah, there's flexible working, you know, you can go home uh, whenever you want if your work is done. But yeah, of course, if you leave at two o'clock, everyone's kind of looking at you and saying, yo, what's going on? Do you not have work to do? Um, so I think if employers can shift their mindset and say that as long as your outcome's achieved, whether you do it in two hours, whether you do it in 20, that would be the real shift that will allow people to be able to be a lot more flexible and just get what they have to do done, whether it takes nine hours or two. Thank you. I think people will learn how to get to a 30-hour work day. It's just purely based on the learning how to leverage. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and, and that could be, I think, from the gig economy, which is growing a lot. So I myself, I, I'm, I'm crazy about it. I have uh, more than 10 developers just purely on the gig economy. And, and, um, but the skill, because the problem with, like, for example, a four hour work week, which is from the book, it makes people think about doing less. Um, but if you try and tell people to, you know what, you have to come up with a 40 hour work day, 50 hour work day, and you only have, obviously, five hours. How do you get there and how do you leverage yourself, your tools around you to try and get their automation or not, um, that I think is gonna, that is gonna happen. Thank you very much. I hope for everyone who was present with us from 7.30 in the morning, it's been a learning experience, right? And we, at least if we will leave this room with one thing that we will do differently, then we, I think, have done an excellent job. And thank you very much, Kerry, Jihan, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to you guys for, for being here this morning and for sharing with us your, your insights. Thank you very much and see you in the conference.